Welcome back to Black Girl World Travel, the podcast. I'm your host, Shira, and I'm thrilled to invite you to explore the world through the eyes of a Black woman. This is more than just a podcast. It's a celebration of travel, adventure, and culture with a purpose. As Black women, our perspective is unique, and it's time to amplify our voices and share our incredible stories. Join me as we inspire and encourage each other to see the world in a new light. This is your go-to lifestyle and travel podcast for meaningful journeys and unforgettable experiences. So whether you're an avid traveler or dreaming of your next destination, come be a part of the Black Girl World Traveler community. Tune in now and stay connected for amazing tales of travel, adventure, and culture that will leave you inspired. This is the Black Girl World Traveler podcast, where wanderlust meets purpose. Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing Christina Belage. Christina is a multilingual serial Black expat and female solo traveler, having traveled to over 40 countries since 2006. She is an award-nominated Best Social Media Marketing Freelancer, and her travel expertise has been featured in Travel Noir and Essence Magazine. Christina, welcome to Black Girl World Traveler, the podcast. Thank you to everyone. All right, Christina, can you tell me a little bit how you got your start in solo travel? So because I live in Europe, it's easier in the sense we have access to a cheap flight ticket with low cost. So it's like in the two digit. So I think when I first started was after uni, when I had my first job. Also because some of my uni friends, we all end up working abroad. So I started to visit friends, family either in Europe, and my brother was in Washington, my cousin were in Montreal, so I used to do Canada and USA every one year and a half, and then venture across Europe because it's cheaper, more accessible, and when I later freelance, I start to travel the world for real, (laughs) yes. Yeah, I started with Cuba, actually. That was the best place. Yeah, as a female, I think it's the best place because first, the cocktails are amazing. I love dancing, being Caribbean. I was treating well. And I was curious because the Cuba we learn at school is different from the reality. Especially also the fact that they liberated nations learn when I went there because I met with I was in the street I thought it was homeless guy and this guy just started to talk to me randomly and he used to be a freedom fighter in Mozambique and I was shocked I was like why you're a hero you know and it's only when you travel that you actually get to see the real reality of the country learn the history and the culture everyone treated me like I was family giving me more food more alcohol (laughs) So some stage I was like, ah, let's run, please, because I still need to move on, you know. So, um, but I was totally uh, blown away um, by seeing like Trinidad and all those, um, how do you say, I didn't know there was, yeah, I think Trinidad, it was the city of the pirates. I didn't know this story, you know, because we, we saw the movie Pirates of the Caribbean, but we didn't know it was throughout the Caribbean. It happens. It's not on just one island. And I think you get the grip because you love the adventure, you love the surprise, and you love the self-growth you get out of it because you have to manage by yourself. You know, there's no escape. You can't count on someone, Uh, especially when you reach uh, troubles. You learn a lot because I think my most troubled stage was in Mexico, in Playa del Carmen. What's his name? Trump was the last one to ban a certain plane. I don't remember if it was Boeing or Airbus, but there was a global ban. And the ban started when I left three weeks before, but then he was the last one to put it. And exactly the day he put it is the day I was supposed to come back. So I got stranded in Mexico. There's, I guess, worst place. It's the first time in my life where I cried because I felt like I could not go back home. I didn't know I would go back home. So it was like midnight. I was trying to call my travel agent in UK. They tried to rip me off and tell me a funky price for change my flight. And I'm like, nah, that's not happening. I tried to beg, beg everything. And at the end, I said, okay, you know what? I'm going to look for a ship flight myself on internet. <laughs> and I did it. I did so many layover, but I went back home. So that's how you learn. You learn that there's a possibility. Everything is possible, but you need to... After all the cry and whinging and panicking, you need to get back on your feet and think, what do you say, in a more reasonable way 
and think, okay, I have to be a problem solver. This, this problem is actually urgent. This is my life, you know? Okay, thanks God. Let's say I had help because Delta put me uh, in an all-inclusive resort, presidential suite. I was like, this is the dream of my life, you know? First time I was in a resort. And um, they also, the problem I had was because I booked two different airlines uh, because I came first in Miami, then I went to Mexico because it was cheaper that way. At that time, um, Cancun flight from UK was super expensive. So I think Miami to Cancun was only $150 and Miami, London was 300 something. So I really did it well, but then I didn't know that the world would be on havoc because of plane ban <laughs> What did that experience teach you about yourself? Huh, that uh, you have to look inside. <laughs> you have to look inside. You're stronger than you think. It's not a question of strong, but I guess it's a question of every, every problem, there's a solution in reality. But sometimes because you're clouded by anger or um, frustration or you feel lost because you feel helpless I think it's I had to give myself permission to be helpless um, because I think I have what do you say I guess I'm a strong woman so I can say it uh, and I don't like to be vulnerable I think that's my biggest weakness and uh, it was to accept I thought the solution would be easy. I call this agent. They will sort it out for me. No. And I'm like, what should I do next? So first I cry for one hour, I remember. I was in this presidential suit and I start to cry, 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 cry. And I'm like, this is the end of the world. I can't go home. I can't back home. What is this? And normally you're excited to go on holiday. You're excited for everything that comes. But then, you you know, there's always some stage at the end of the holiday when things start to go wrong. And you know it's time to go back home. Uh, I was in this stage. I was like, I want to go home. I'm fed up of this and I need to go back to work. You know, there's all kind of stuff. And um, I was like, okay, it's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay not to have all the solution straight away. It's okay to take some time, cry it out, let your emotion come through and then uh, come back to it when you are, how do you say, cold headed. I think that was the lesson learned because I kind of, yeah, I hate to be weak. <laughs> so I should say it. It's true. It's true. It's, yeah, it's true. So give you, pres I think that's a great lesson for women, especially black women. Give, your per give yourself permission to be helpless. I'm going to, I wrote that down because that's incredibly yeah. powerful. And I often think that, you know, the world doesn't allow for us or we feel that the world doesn't allow for that because the world is like fucked up and, you know, like we just constantly have to solve our own problems. So it's like I don't have even the space or time to just let my hair down and just say, you know what, I yeah, need to help let myself out. down. Yeah. yeah. That is a very, um, that's a hard balance to like maneuver that's a very hard challenge that's a I feel like that's a challenge of every black woman that I know mm -hmm. <laughs> um and so I'm happy and I'm glad that you're you know vulnerable yeah. well enough to talk about yeah. it because it's, it's real this I, this idea that we always need to have the answers and have it all figured out and you know what's next and you know it's it's a it's a it's a burden that it's I think easy. we should begin to it's release it's a burden Yes, I think um, because especially when you're the eldest, you're so used to all the thought. And uh, also in my situation is because my parents divorced when I was in my 30s. So um, I became the, let's say, ambassador and the link in between the family. So it's heavy because he, I think he plays a also in my relationship. So I tend to not show my weakness because I'm used to step up to kind of arrange everyone. And uh, it took me to do two therapy to realize that I need to let go. I can't. 
um, always be the strong, the champion or the hero for everyone, basically. I think as black women, whether we are sister, daughters, um, how do you say, partners, wife, mothers, everyone rely on us. And uh, we are trapped in this uh, superwoman role where, um, because there's so many people who depend on us when they're lost, that we forget to be vulnerable. We forget to that we have the right to cry. We have the right not to know what's next for us. Uh, even if we show this hyper-confidence face, deep inside we have either the imposter syndrome or we know sometimes, oh, I'm weak, but I should not show it because or else the world will you know, pounce on me like lions. So I prefer to show that I'm a lioness 24-7 and it's not possible. <laughs> it's not possible. Uh, it wears up with time. It wears out with time. So you... It's um, yeah. So it's hard always for me, so even to confide. Oh, I have these issues. If I say that to someone, it means you mean the world to me. For me to open up and tell you, I'm suffering. <laughs> it's just like you are really, really close. You're in my heart. So it's um, it's hard. But we have to self acknowledge. Uh, we have to do therapy to get he to get rid of all the trauma and uh, all the obligation we've been put on, I think, because we are raised with a lot of obligation, especially when you're the eldest, you're supposed to uh, manage the one after you, you know, um, because I remember when, that's why I expatriate myself. I think that's the, people always went, oh, why do you go and live? I said, okay, there was all kind of reason, but I think the main reason was to escape the family. So, <laughs> and grow your own personality, your own life, uh, not have your uncle, uh, and they still harass you, you know, they still harass me, I remember, but um, either on social media, they always find a way to contact you, but sometimes you're like, let me, just let me live my own life and make my decision. I will learn some errors, but um, I don't need to be scrutinized every 20 minutes, or I don't need to be scrutinized every weekend. And Starting to travel as a black woman is super empowering, but it intimidates more other people. That's why I realized, that's why I removed myself on Facebook and all those things, because well, I stopped posting about travel only um, when I start to create my company. I did back because I used to get so much hate. And that's why now I'm, I'm using this as humor post. Uh, I remember just all those sentences like, oh, you're traveling again, you know, and you're like, so what, <laughs> you know, do I ask you, uh, uh, you have another baby now or you're going to the gym five times a week? You know, it's it's just those nasty comments where uh, it's always come from people who have not been to places as well. I remember when I said I was going to Jamaica, they was like, oh, why would you go there? And because I'm Caribbean and I'm curious. And it's not your business. So it's like you always have to justify yourself. I think we need to come out of the justify line and say, this is my decision, respect it. If you have this type of hobby, do I come and criticize and scrutinize? No. Um, but it became... Everyone, from friends to family, your uncle to say, when will you get married and have three babies? And it's becoming tired. <laughs> I was like, on a Saturday night, this one, I don't know what happened to him, if he was depressed or anything. But he took on to bully me for one hour uh, on Facebook. And I was like, okay, I'm no longer replying. I think I was in a salsa club dancing. I was like, why am I there? Why am I ending up replying to him? I'm feeding his anger. I'm feeling his frustration. So sometimes you need to, when you're younger, I think you don't know how to put boundaries. I think that's something that really, um, you would have, if I had was more firm, younger in boundaries making, I think I wouldn't have to justify my choices so much. And I would have lived with more peace. That's what I would say. So for younger black women, I would say, if you whatever passion you have, pursue it because you never know where it will lead you. And also it will feed your soul because what we are not taught, we are only taught about 
responsibilities and taking care of others. We're not taught about self-care, which is the most important thing. If you take care of yourself, you will go much further in life because it's not just your body, it's your soul. Your soul, your emotional well-being is the most important thing for you to carry yourself. Because when you fell in depression, I can tell you, I just come out from work. Uh, it's, yeah, it's like you forget about yourself. It's because you forget about yourself. It's because you think about the past. You can't project yourself. You're stuck in, I was good in this comfortable zone. But in fact, uh, life disrupts you for a reason because life wants you to open new doors, meet new people, and uh, reshape your personality. Not maybe your personality, but reshape the way you see the world. And I think travel gives you this gift. Um, it gives you the gift of coming out of all the cliches you've been told, uh, which really hinder your perception of the world and kind of keeps you trapped in the system you are. Like in the West, you know, growing up, I was seeing so many negative images of Africa, I remember, uh, the Somalian anger crisis. That's the only thing I had. And my first country was Senegal. When I've been, I was Star Trek. Everyone asked me, how oh, was it? My dad was calling me every minute, you're going to get kidnapped. That was so funny. <laughs> I was like, whatever. Yeah, because you're going to go for Gambia, they kidnap women there. Yeah, I don't think so. But anyway, so... I went to a friend because it was my first time in Africa, so I knew I would be safe. She had a bed and breakfast. She she had a network. And, uh, yeah, I knew that nothing would happen to me. And Senegal is a very peaceful country, so I'm not going to be kidnapped, but whatever. So, you know, and I came back Star Trek. They all asked me questions. Oh, how was it? Da, da, da. It was not dangerous. I said, no, people are like you and me. They work. They're super. They're hustlers. There's middle class. There's all kind of class. It's the same. It's not... It's just that uh, they might have less infrastructure in some countries compared to others, but I see no one begging. I'm sorry. Uh, in Paris, I see so many people in the street so or in Los Angeles or in New York. So, you know, and I was like, it, sh it showed me that uh, not to believe everything you see on TV or media, you have to create your own reality to check what's accurate, if you can. So... Uh, obviously, you have funky stories happening, like because you're foreign, you have people try to scam you. Not scam you, but more the taxes, they ask you double. You know, they, you negotiate, your friend negotiated for me. That was funny. The first two days she negotiated everywhere I was going. And once I'm alone with the taxi, the story is different. <laughs> the story is different. We start to argue. And in Senegal, uh, old man have this sentence I'm going to marry you, you know, as if it's a punishment. <laughs> And I'm like, you could be my grandpa. So I argue with this guy for 45 minutes. Then I drop it and I'm like, okay, give me his money. Let me go. Because I have to move on. I'm supposed to visit this place and not be stuck arguing with you. You know? And then um, I ask my friend, I say, Aurelia, I, uh, don't you know a driver? Because this is not possible. I'm not going to be able to do 10 days like that. Every day arguing with people I don't know. Uh, do you have a driver? She said, oh, I know you're from Europe. I said, yeah, but you're from Europe too. Hello. So, so find me somewhere. And uh, yeah, she recommended me a guy, 20 euros a day. We did the whole, uh, every day we did 200, 250 kilometers. We did the whole uh, Somon area. It was lovely. I've done, because at that time, there was not so many uh, tourism, uh, apart from mass tourism and for white people in resort. So there was not like guiding company, etc. Everything was roots. So I'm glad I've done it like that because um, I could ask him questions about the culture, about um, the magazine. And also I didn't want to go to Dakar. I wanted to always, whenever I go to Africa, I try to come out of the capital and go in the village because I want to see the reality. And um, the food was amazing. We had the best time. Uh, I went for New Year's Eve and I kept it as a tradition to try to go in a hot country for New Year's Eve to um, see the new year, to start the new year on a new, how do you say, renewal phase. Um, to be in a hot country is good. Yeah. Whenever I can afford <laughs> and plan it. Yes. Okay.
I know we we, we kind of talked about it, but I just want to clarify. Um, what is a serial black? But what is a serial black expat, and what countries have you lived in outside of your own? Ah, uh, so I've mostly lived in Europe. I, as a baby, I think I live in Guadeloupe. Uh, my uh, grandmother raised me for one year or two. Um, and I lived, uh, okay, in France because I was born there, but then I went to UK. I think I lived nearly 16 years here. <laughs> As that's why I'm a citizen. I lived in Germany and I live in Netherlands, in Amsterdam. Um, Amsterdam, I didn't stay long. I stayed three months, I think. The job was not what I was promised. And I think my soul didn't connect either. It's the first place where I felt displaced. I can say it like that. Um, because I was working too much seven days a week and I uh, didn't have time to make friends or anything. Um, I felt like this place, my soul could not connect. So I left, I left the job and I went back in London. Um, while in Germany, it was peaceful. I was in an international company. I think it was 72 nationalities. And um, I love what I did. I was learning a new discipline. I was in a good environment. Um, I could travel back to France and see my family for work, you know. So um, it was different. It was a family-owned legacy business. You see the difference a bit better. So I think it's about how you're treated, how you um, integrate, even if uh, I was learning a bit of the language. I also live in a good area, um, who is retiring retired people yeah there was this funny story i could say when i move in um in germany they're really serious about recycling i didn't know that they were so serious so i think when i arrived i put my carton a bit in the wrong bin what didn't i do i was harassed for one month by uh, my uh, the whole building <laughs> to put uh, letters on my door and my letterbox and because i didn't speak german i was like what the hell is this you know and then I was lucky one of my um, neighbors, she's German, but she lives in Geneva, so she spoke French. And she explained to me, she said, oh, you pissed them off because you put your carton in the wrong place. I was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. <laughs> so sorry. And then um, she told me, this is where you need to put them. And she printed a guide on how to recycle in Germany because you have to have six different bins. You know, I never had so many. I only had one or two. Um, and even because the glass, they have four types of glass, for example, they have brown, white, green, and another one. Um, they, the paper and carton, they separate. And also something it took me months to learn, um, water bottle or any like soda, you need to bring them back because you pay 50 cents extra. So you need to bring them back to be refounded. <laughs> and I didn't know. I used to throw everything away. <laughs> so I lost a lot of money in three months. You know, so it's all those things um, when you don't know. Because even if I had a relocation agent who was super nice, who gave me a brochure, how to go to work, this is the transport, this is the dentist, where to go. Uh, uh, you said gynecologist who speak English, da, da, da. Those practical things you learn on experience. So... That's why I say multi um, serial expat because I lived in four or five countries and it helps you. You need to renew yourself. You need to create community. You need to be curious because uh, you can't just arrive here and know it, it all, basically. I think in the US, uh, you stay within the same country, but it's like you live in 50 countries because every state's got their own culture and, uh, let's say, lifestyle. So when for European, it's more rare to be like that because usually people stay in the same country they were born in. Um, I knew since I was a kid I wanted to learn languages and move around in the sense I was curious about other culture and also because I was against some, let's say, cultural traits of my country, <laughs> which is discrimination and other things. Um, because... French culture is very much, what do you say, static and put you in a box. Um, and it can be stifling, I guess, <laughs> for people who think differently. Um, because for them, if you were born in that country, that place, like, 
uh, he was raised in the suburbs. So there's stereotypes, you know, you are kind of put in the box. It's a bit like you say, oh, you're from, a, you're from, I won't say you're from the ghetto, but there's this duality where you have the Uber rich, you have the affluent, and then you have the son and daughter of immigrants. Even if you go to university, you're not being considered the same because they will always try to refer you to your son, your son of, your daughter of, uh, oh, you come from this area, therefore you don't have potential, you, you know, you, and it's, and I was like, hell with this, you know, <laughs> hell with this, I'm going to try somewhere else. Um, I don't want to be labeled. I just want to be me, you know, and it's, it's, yeah. Okay, so you talked about being a serial black expat and besides when you lived in Guadalupe and white countries, I'm wondering what do you think about, do you think black people should be considered expats when they're in black countries? Yes, 100%, 100%. because that's because my goal. That's my goal. And I know people who did it already. I'm friends with some people because in France and in UK, there's a huge repat movement. I know in in US you have black seat. Um, it's kind of the equivalent. It's because we realize we need to be... There's all kinds of reasons. I think the first reason is we want to be at peace because we're kind of running away from, um, what do you say, hyper-capitalism, discrimination, racism, yeah, structural things that you can't combat because they've been on since the days of the days, let's <laughs> say. So... I don't want to say I always love when I hear people say if I'm fighting racism, but because when you get older, you're like, you can't fight it because um, that's the way the system is done. The only way to fight it is to restructure and build on the other side um, so that the power plays becomes different because now you have everyone, Russia, China, um, even you see in the West, some people are saying, yeah, let's recolonize Africa. This is horrible to hear. But this is happening somehow, um, especially in some industry like tourism or minerals. So, or, yeah, precious gemstone. Because I worked for some big company in diamonds and stuff. So the game, I've seen, you know, you market them, they market a certain message, but you know what's going on. So I would say... You have to be, how do you say, intentional. You have to have a business or some Airbnb because I see the one who've done it. You need to have built a real project to um, back up your uh, way of living. Um, and you need to also make community with the locals and with Repat, but don't just say with expat or Repat because they're in a bubble of, what can I say? artificiality um, sometimes you need to make sure that you bring a contribution to wherever you will go and you're not just um, running away from problems yeah got you so i'm also curious to hear your thoughts around because we do have blacks that we do have like um I guess it's a level of consciousness, especially, I think, started um, at least in the United States in my lifetime, like after the Black Lives Matter movement and then COVID exacerbated everything. We realized that, oh, like the structures are faulty and like the system is fundamentally mm -hmm. not repairable. Mm -hmm. I feel like people really started to accept that. Maybe we knew that, but people yeah. started to accept yeah. that. And so yeah. Yeah. I think repatriation to black countries is 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 the goal, right? It's it's my goal to, you know, die in Africa and that is the motherland. I'm also curious to hear your thoughts around though. A lot of those countries are, you know, have sold out to like capitalism or ran by um, or dictated by like the interest yeah, yeah. of white countries. So I'm wondering how we move just like repatriation is the first step, but I think there's like a larger conversation that, must, that needs to be had. So I'm wondering your thoughts on that. Yeah. So 
Okay, I'm in a few diasporan group and I know some as well. So I know the reality, let's say, on the ground, especially in Tanzania, because I've been often. Uh, and I follow a few French groups who encourage repatriation for younger people. Uh, but for, for jobs, so it's a bit different and some for business. So I think where the diaspora is, um, I don't want to say wrong or misled, is we should not come as a yes, neo-colonizer and say we're going to overrule or stuff. But to have power, we need uh, economic power. That's a reality and political power. Um, because I see, for example, I feel like Ghana is becoming 50 second states of US, to be honest. But um, because there's so many Afro-American coming. So the direct impact is life. Cost of life is much higher. And sometimes they have a crisis with their own currency exchange. So there's a, there should be a balance in between a whole population coming over and do you have the right people coming? And also something I see is uh, when you're in Africa, even if you go as a tourist, your own community is kind of, not everyone is, let's say, some go much older in life and they have retirement. Some come, they buy flats and they became Airbnb owners, but some are struggling as well. It's not everybody who is a millionaire going back, let's say. Let's say it's real. Um, and you have this tendency where they pretend it's a community, but then when you ask for $50, and they're like, what? <laughs> it's like everything becomes commercial again so it's like i don't want to say mayor of the city but it's like new community it's still kind of uh headless chicken you know what i mean because i've i was following a few um like mark in africa and all this stuff before to visit tanzania myself and he was the first one to say that there's no structure but we need to build it i think the problem is each one is a king or queen of his castle. And then the same behavior you see in the state or in the UK, you see them when you go back. If you only stick to the community because of the name, oh, I understand them, they understand me, you know, we, we relate. No, there's no relate because there was lots of complaints on YouTube uh, before I went because I was watching um, during COVID and stuff. People saying, yeah, you know, a lot of people came, especially in Arusha um, or Mochi, which are more rural areas. Um, they came, but they had no plan. So, oh, yeah, you bought land, but if you have no plan to farm, it's the point, you know. So then they were crying on, t on YouTube. They just do YouTube channel to complain about everything in the country, which I think is sad because first you should have done research. Second, you should have done a bit of scouting trip to understand the culture, learn the language, integrate. Um, and I see so many people who fell in that trap. And then they're like, oh, I have to go back. Yeah, because there was no plan. In Africa, you're on your own. You're not, you can't have benefits and stuff like that because the system is not built enough for their own locals. Um, so you need to come to contribute, not come to take. And I think um, the entitlement mentality needs to stop. Um, and that's why you have more and more association being built outside first from um, in, within the diaspora. And they help you, for, you pay obviously, but uh, to go scooting trip. Because if you don't have the guts to do it yourself, you might as well try to find structure to help you to assess is this for me am i ready can i make um, what do you say network first and see what's there for me what's the opportunity uh should we do a group project or should i do my own you know and i think all this reflection most people don't have it they just want to run away they're like yeah i'm fed up of here i'm fed up of there yeah but the same problem was follow you in fact because you need to address them before you go. You need to, um, that's why I, I interviewed a few um, French girls who did like one year abroad, either in West Africa or five African countries in six months. 
to find where they resonate, where they feel, um, what do you say, good, even if it's not their parents' country. And I think this approach is good also. You don't necessarily have to go to your parents' country, but uh, because, yeah, you have roots like that, maybe that country, there's bad political, there's bad mentality, there's poisoning, there's jealousy, you know, kind of thing. So where would be treated best? I think uh, first is if you think on a selfish level, you're like, where would I be treated best? Uh, but if you feel on a collective level is how can I contribute to this economy I will join? That's a beautiful way of thinking at it. Uh, thinking about repatriation to a, um, a black nation. What can I contribute and not... I just want to go because I'm running away. And I think that for those of us that live in the West, myself included, I'll even include myself in this, that requires a complete (laughs) shift in your thought process. Like you have to become a different person and prepare to fundamentally live a different life. Like the Africa is not America. (laughs) It's just simply not. The Caribbean is not America. Like you have to be prepared to to switch your mind and really undo the layers of like racism and like imperialistic, capitalistic training that we have. And that is a huge undertaking. Um, Do you think that it can be done? Like on a mass level and not just a few pockets yeah, there, yeah. A few, yeah. Yeah, because I see, uh, I'm part of uh, repat communities. I mean, I network with them because I was hoping to join at some stage. So I see, uh, you know, the one which are end of life, I would say, which we came as retirement is different for them because they just want the good weather, let's say. A uh, nice house, blah, 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 and the perks of servant. Can I say that? <laughs> uh, cheap labor. So it's different for them. But the one who came with business ideas or um, political statement in the sense, okay, I'd rather, been, uh, I'd rather been out of Babylon than in, um, they... Okay, there's two different, because I know personally, because whenever I go, I meet them. So let's say, for example, uh, in Tanzania, there was a specific situation where a lot of people came during COVID because there was only two countries open. I think there was Mexico and uh, and uh, da, da, da. Mexico and Tanzania, which were um, vaccine-free. So a lot of people just... For, um, yeah, they just immigrate suddenly. And then now you bump into them sometimes. Some left, some came back, some left, some came back. And for example, the one who didn't plan it, they were um, dodgily on student visa. And at some stage, the government cracked down on this thing. Have you been studying for three years? <laughs> for real? You know, it doesn't make sense. So you, some, somehow we end up in the same pitfall we criticize immigrant doing, you know. So you have to you have to be a bit prepared in the sense, okay, have you, do you have savings? Have you thought about a business? Or you don't necessarily need to have your business in Africa, but you need either income source from outside or from inside. So you need to decide all this and prepare for it, not just jump on the plane and say, yeah, I'll see what happened. Because what happened is then people whinging on YouTube. And I don't think it's a YouTube topic to whinge every day. <laughs> you know, And say, oh, I need help, I need help. Uh, okay, I'm bouncing to Ghana next. Oh, wow. Well. So you're just going to bounce country to countries until, you know, you you realize the problem was not the country, it was you. So that's where I was watching all this and I was a bit critical because I was like, you need to have done, before I would say your layer of adaptation, you need to have thought through, why are you coming there? Is it to, yeah, run away from all those rubbish that we've been exposed to? Uh, it's not going to clean your system from the minute you lay land, you lay foot on land, we say. Um, because, um, for example, when I went in Jamaica, I met lots of free from UK. 
they came because they were, a lot of them were, what did you say, working in the medical services or industry. So they run away because um, UK government imposed them to have the vaccine. They didn't want to be vaccinated like most black people. So, um, yeah, you have to readapt. You're not going to have the luxuries uh, the let's say fast food access, you know, the Amazon access, all of this. So you need to learn to recycle, upcycle, you know, um, or resell stuff. Yeah, it's about being resourceful. And I've met also a few Jamaican who came from the US and the smart one, they were working for airlines because some, what they did, they relocated to Kingston so that they pay three, four times less rent. So that's very smart to do that. And then you can still go to work in New York, it's less than, I think, 45 minutes, you know. So sometimes there's ways to do things, but it's also because in the black community, there's too much gatekeeping, I would say, first of all. Um, so that's why I'm part of a lot of network and I always try to cross share opportunities because I feel it's important. If I didn't know about, for example, the scholarship opportunities I had or working in summer to fund my studies, I would have never progressed, but sometimes I've been, I had to always research. At the time, no internet started when I was 18. So before I was 18, um, you have to go to local institution, you know, and bank doors and find out the info because, you know, your family doesn't come from this world. So or I ask my uh, high school teacher, should I go in these studies? Because my parents can't help me and point me there, you know? Or I look for my older auntie, say, oh, I need a loan, but, you know, I don't know if my parents can back me up. Could you do it for me, you know? So it's like being brave enough to look for the information and take action. And um, I'm glad when I see some people who say, oh, thank you to have posted this. I apply, I got it. Yeah, because it's not because it's not for me that it won't be for you. You know, if we all had this mentality of sharing is caring, um, it's not because it's not my age bracket that it won't benefit someone after me, you know? Uh, I feel like we would be much further in life, all of us, if we had this mentality, no gatekeeping, uh, yeah. I think that's a capitalistic mindset that, like, resources are scarce, and so you have to hold on to it. and. Um, as opposed to an abundant mindset or like a more communal mindset that if like what's for me and J I'm Jamaican so it's the same like yeah. what's for you can I miss you like if it's for you it's gonna be for you no matter what and that doesn't mean that you have to like I, I like to think of it like a fist oh, like no. the more you you hold on to it so tight that it just slips mm -hmm. away from you as opposed to just like if you actually yeah. open your hands you are in a position to receive um what is for you um yeah. and to release you know what is not and so that is a that's a beautiful point um do you think that that mindset exists in black nations that that gatekeeping because i i definitely see that in america where like you know people who ascend uh, to a certain place in their career um or even like in a travel space when i first started it wasn't a lot of people now there's only like i feel like a few people yeah. and i think that those there's a mentality that like i have to be the representative and it's ego driven right like i want to be that one that black face in that high space yeah. do you think that that yeah, mentality that... exists okay. good outside of them and, and do you think that mentality exists in yeah. black nations um, as well yes 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 because uh okay i've dated some african side so <laughs> um there's this mentality of uh, nobody share because yeah i spoke and what I've learned is, like, for example, they don't really have access to mentorship and all these things. Those things are very Western. There's this mentality of whoever went there first, hold on to the market and don't share because they're afraid if they give it to the young one coming, it's going to take him over. And uh, this kind of shocked me because coming from yeah, a Caribbean background, we help each other because, especially I come from a small island, so... I've always been raised where 
my parents, they share a lot, they give food. Um, I was shocked because my dad know every Caribbean person we meet, I don't know. And then I realized, ah, yes, because it's a small island, everyone knows each other. Because I was always shocked. I was like, oh, does he know? He always knows someone. Oh, I used to play football with them. Oh, I went to military school with them. Oh, I've done that. And I was like, how did it? And I realized, oh, they were my neighbor. Yeah, because officially our island is 400,000 people and outside we are 1 million. So we are considered small island. That's why everyone knows each other. And we have a joke where you could be cousin with anybody, <laughs> basically. So it's different. Like when I was in Ghana, I remember we had a chauvin. And I was like, why don't they stop to help us? And the night was coming. So say, but this is Africa, man. We They think that you might be a scammer and kidnap this. <laughs> the fuck? And I remember another situation in Jamaica, totally different. Um, the, how do you say, eater or the engine just didn't go on fire, but it was like steaming, yeah, or something like that. And everyone in the village when around Portland, they came down and helped us. So I'm like, island versus mainland, you know, um, or motherland is different because um, highland, we have to all help each other because we're stuck on this rock, more or less. And uh, we've learned to overcome so many difficulties together, I think. While in Africa, because it's bigger, it's whoever was, let's say, closer to, I don't want to say the master or the colonizer, could get ahead and kind of hold to it. Um, because I was like, none of those cars stop. I was shocked. If it was in the Caribbean, everyone come down. And I've seen it and I've experienced it. So I've experienced it in Jamaica, I've experienced it in Guadeloupe, so, and even in Cuba. So uh, if I'm lost, some people come and ask me, I remember I was like, because yeah, colorism. Uh, I was staying as a white Cuban uh, house because it's different. They invented the Airbnb, in fact. And uh, she was so racist, this woman. First thing she said, how? Uh, be careful because I arrived at night I was angry so I said do you know there's a restaurant around it yeah yeah go down but be careful don't talk to the very dark one I said what the fuck I'm black man don't you see and in my family we have all shades so I'm like she didn't realize who she's speaking to she just keeps on telling me so many colorism stuff yeah the darker the most dangerous no it's <laughs> what the fuck is this and I'm like okay I have one week to spend with this woman okay interesting and then um so because of her, she ingrained fear in me while normally I would just go out and speak to people who look like me, right? So I remember I was lost. I was looking for the ATM. There's this guy who tried to talk to me. And because of her, I stopped and think, should I talk to him? He really robbed me. You know, why am I not supposed to have this mindset? And the guy is like, and what I learned about Cuban is they're multilingual too. Most of them speak four or five languages. They're super bright. They're super educated. All of them are master level because that's the way um, the Cuban government gave them the two most important things, uh, free healthcare and free education. Um, so this guy came to me because normally you arrange, you know, the 1950s American car tour. And now he's like, you're lost. And then he's, he's, he speaks to me in French. And I say, and I'm like, on my guard, while normally I'm not. And he's like, relax. <laughs> I'm not going to steal you. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm so sorry, brother. You know, it's because of his switch. I, I, I start to be defensive while he was like, no, the, there's two ATM. You can go to that one, that one. I can accompany you. The same, I went out at the end with a Cuban because every day you have 50 guys who flirt with you. So at the end, I, I said yes. Um, and the thing I was shocked is uh, in Cuba, they take all of your bags at the entrance of the club. So nobody steal each other. You know, even at the supermarket, you just keep your money in your pocket. So, and I was like, in those Western countries, we learn so much about distrusting everyone. and in some black nation, it's the whole opposite, especially in the Caribbean. So I would say it's more in the Caribbean than in Africa. Um, we are more community led in the sense because we are stuck on this rock, as I say, um, we need to make a way out of what we have. Um, 
and we become our first resource. And I was shocked because I was like, what the hell? If I listen to this woman, she would just, you know, she like hijack my way of thinking, my culture, me interacting with the people I know. Um, and I've been treated best, obviously, by my black people there. So, um, yeah. And then she tell me, this is my friend and it's a maid. You know, <laughs> colorism 100%. And it's weird to to end up in a space where you're like, someone puts the, yeah, their negative ideas and perception in your head and you shift the way you interact with everyone. So thanks God it only happened. Then I will ask, and um, and uh, they're happy to see. Actually, they were super happy to see another Caribbean, because I never met people so happy to see other Caribbean, because they wanted to ask me questions. They're super curious. Oh, is the Caribbean experience for you somewhere else? And I say, oh, I live in Europe. And then sometimes, you know, you're lost in life, and I end up having a conversation with. Um, you see a grandpa, yeah, oldie. He was the world we eight time world record holder of the longest cigar in the world by Guinness Book. And his cigar is exposed uh, on the ceiling. And uh, he said, hey, My sister, where are you from? Da, da, da. So I said, Oh, I'm Guadeloupe, I live in England. He said, But my sister, you're free. You can travel everywhere. You can have your company. Here we're stuck unless you are a sports person, a dancer, a musician, you can come out. That's why so many young girls, yeah, they want to marry you after two hours. That's another story. <laughs> because they want papers to come out of the island. They, they're stuck and, yeah, they feel stuck. Um, while, and he, yeah, he put it just like, we start to talk and then he start to tell me, but this is a positive aspect of your life you're not, you complain, you know, sometimes we have this entitlement kind of, or I expect to be there because the society said I should have been done that, that, that. And you speak with elders and that's where he clarify your mind. They make you realize you're doing good. So stop complaining, just keep on moving. Um, and I think it's only when you travel that you get a sense to acknowledge that your life is rich, you know, not, uh, I don't want to say you need to be a millionaire because I think in American society, British society, I mean, a lot of the Western society is hyper capitalistic and you lose sense of who you are on the way. While uh, when you travel and you really connect or you slow travel the best way, you stay like if you can three weeks to one month, you get to know the destination, you get to understand um, the lifestyle, the culture, and uh, you realize either you're that you are lucky because you have the privilege to move around and see different lives or different experience. Especially when uh, we have yeah passport from the West, we are we are super lucky because we can go anywhere. While uh, people in Africa can't, even if they are visa free to the Caribbean, there's no direct line, so they can't go. Um, you know, so you realize that when you see people like uh, Wode Maya, the Ghanaian uh, influencer, he went up to Brazil, he went to the Caribbean, visit different islands. I think it was good to see an African doing that. Usually they don't know us unless they come to France, to Europe or to US. We don't exist for them, kind of. Because at school, they're not being told that your grandchildren's been sent to islands. <laughs> uh, they only know more or less the white world, the black world, but they don't acknowledge that we exist. And it's good for us to show up and to say there's different black experience. Um, there's, yes, there's the African way, there's the Afro American way, but there's also the Caribbean way, there's also the Brazilian way, because they are the biggest diaspora. People always dismiss them. Um, and uh, yeah, you're blessed. You, I think it will enrich you much more than you will lose in the sense you have a fuller grasp of the way the world works. And uh, where are you in the black experience spectrum? Because when I went to Brazil, I was shocked. I was like, wow. Um, 
they're 50 years behind America segregation in that, in some sense, um, because they're still being harassed, discriminated, killed by police. And it's very mainstream. That's the worst part. The, the part is that it's normal, you know, and you're like, for real? <laughs> you know, I, I went for a Kizomba festival and the resort we've been, it was the most resort, that's the most racist experience I've lived. We were invisible. All the black people, we were invisible. Like when it's I in Brazil, people, it means you lift it's your so hand, you, you ask, ask the staff, staff to come. come. Yeah, yeah, it's on it's, it's, it's a place. It's like, like an island. An island. Mm -hmm. um, and um, we went for a Kizomba festival. So I was, you know, coming happy, jolly. So first, Brazilians are super competitive about dancing. <laughs> so if you're not good, they spin you out. <laughs> first shock. <laughs> Uh, the only white people who talk to me are the Argentinian, the European, because they have no problem. They know, you know, I'm human. But the Brazilian, they just dismiss you. You don't exist. That's so weird. And I end up, um, yeah, having lunch, hanging around with the black Brazilian, Angolan, Cap Verdean who came. Uh, we are like a family. We, we take over a table. We're like 12 every day every lunch, every dinner. Nobody calculates us. This is, I think, you know, the, the I think there was, a, yeah, the American book, Invisible Man. That's the first time in my life I felt invisible. I say, hi. Or, you know, the only time they calculate me was when I go to reception because I, there was lots of mosquito. I said, do you have a mosquito repellent? I forgot to have one. They gave me one. But if you are in the... <clears throat> In the resort, or if you are like at lunch where there's the buffet, nobody, everyone ignore you. That's the weirdest shit ever. <laughs> Can I say that? That's the weirdest ever. You don't exist. So, and I felt valued, yeah, valu val yeah, violated, yeah, violated, because I was like, I've never been treated. It's not like poorly. It's 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 more than poorly. It's just like people don't acknowledge you. So it's like, am I a ghost? <laughs> Like that's so weird, and they go to the white people and they they pass in front of you. Even if you call them, they don't react. It's weird. It's like you're in a movie. And what city? I'm sorry. What city was this in Brazil? You observe things. So it's not. Yeah, can I? I don't want to. I don't want to. No, we need to know but, um, because, yeah. for example, the, this is not the. <laughs> This is not the experience that people say they have, like when they go to Bahia, which is where a lot of black Brazilians are. So we need to know what city oh, and state. Yeah, yeah, what yeah. city and state was this in Brazil? <laughs> so, so I think, think on Grand 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 it's like, it's a, like a, 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 it's a famous, famous resort. resort. It's, it's like, like a small, small island, island and it's, it's, there's resort, resort on it. Those, right? And, uh, this was, was from Rio. Rio. Okay. Yeah, like two things. And oh, those days. Okay. Um, and mm -mm. We, okay. Took, uh, we took a coach to go. Yeah, yeah just, just to say, I'm sorry, but this is my experience, and I was shocked. And when I talked to the my Brazilian friend, they kind of gave me revelation, like. Uh, for them, it's normal to be paid uh, three or four times less than the white Brazilian. And I was shocked. That's why I was like, what? You're 50 years ahead. You're 50 years behind. Uh, we don't, everyone is paid equally, you know, in other countries. What what not in the US, but uh, but three to four times is a lot less. That's like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. no. <laughs> exactly. That's why... That's why... Uh, when I was younger, I was always wondering why don't we see more uh, black Brazilian abroad? It's because first, most of them don't have passport um, because they don't have the money or they're not declared. What I've learned is they're not declared. If they were born in the favelas, they don't exist officially um, because uh, they're not on the register. And I was like, what is this? Because I remember my British ex told me that because his parents live over 10 years in Brazil. And he told me, yeah, it's only when they work for a white person as a maid, they get their papers. I said, do you think it's normal to tell me that? <laughs> like, what? This is weird. Wow. I was like, this is, you know, I was like, nah. 
this is another world. For me, it was another reality. I was like, this is not possible. And then I spoke to the, my black Brazilian friend and I asked them all this. And they tell me, yeah, it's true. If you were not, if you're born in the favelas, you don't exist. That's why um, the official population number is never accurate. Because uh, supposedly black Brazilian are like in between 90 million to 120 million of the population. So they are actually 56 or 60 percent of the population, but we never see it officially because it's been that is a tactic so by the government like, to wow. keep black Brazilians down. That is yeah, horrific. Yeah. I am yeah, horrified yeah, by yes, that. Yes. And that is so actually it's only when I've been there, I've realized. No, that's my, I was just going to say, that's my only regret is that I didn't mm. study abroad in Brazil. Like I wish I would have. I wanted to go to Bahia. Mm -hmm. um, but that's heartbreaking to hear. And it makes me want to act <laughs> and do something. But go ahead. Yeah, that's heartbreaking. Yeah, but I was, because the time I've been, I went, I spent one week in Rio. And uh, it was the week where the, I think, uh, mayor associate, which was actually black, she was, yeah, she was like Mestiza, uh, half black, and uh, she was lesbian as well. So she was murdered that week. Oh, and, yes. Uh, um, she, I know what she is. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. 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 And uh, it was a very, like, anti-political act because... She was fighting for the right of people from the favelas and also LGBTQ. So Mari, we have um, to say her name, Marielle Franco. Wow, wow. Marielle Franco. Yes. Yeah, Maria yeah, Franco Maria. and Maria Franco. Yeah, and I was, I was shocked a bit because I was like, "What's happening here?" So it means that there's, yeah, there's this movement where. The country won't progress because the elite will keep, you know, everyone down, you know, kind of. Uh, and also because I started to do, uh, so I, I did the little Rio tour where you visit where um, they had the slave market. And uh, because this area is brand new and has been a bit gentrified, there's a maritime museum. Then you still have a lot of. Uh, Afro-Brazilian restaurant, uh, but all this area used to be where all the slaves came, basically, and were negotiated and traded. Um, and you have also the Museum of Favelas, where they're trying to make cool favelas is cool and trendy. <laughs> it's like it's a bit, it's a bit uh, propaganda to try to make things, you know, look super accepted. Um, but. <laughs> The thing is, when I was with my Afro-Brazilian friend, they, we did, you know, the there's a mural. Uh, this has been extended for after the Olympic Games. It was the mural of the five, uh, I think the five continents, something like that. And um, we were walking there and there was a lady selling T-shirt. And they just grabbed me and said, yeah, when you see this T-shirt, and I was like, because it was in Portuguese, I was like, okay, what does it mean? And she's like, it means that when one of us made it, everyone rise up and I was like what and then she started to tell me about the salary situation and all those things and also the discrimination at university was still still happening because you get discriminated if you have natural afro hair you can't register and all these things and I was like wow my god you're so behind I was like this is uh, so real this is stuff in here you know I was like, this is stuff in it because then I realized why do I know only white Brazilian also in Europe is because Usually they use their privilege because of European ancestry. So they always have two passports. Either Italian, most of them, they come with their grandmother Italian passport. Or German or Polish or whatever. While the blacks, first they don't have papers because they're not on the register. So they don't have... Uh, because I was always like, why we always see outside some bad dancers? They're the only one who come out to represent, you know? There's never... A, a black Brazilian doctor or academics coming out, they can't. They don't have those privileges. They don't have the dual passport. They don't have the European ancestry. So then, you st and I used to only have, yeah, white Brazilian who also explained me their version of their country. And I was like, wow, so you're telling me that all of you can come out, but the rest are stuck, basically. 
So there's no way to elevate apart from football or being a model. That's why most of the one we see outside are model, uh, dancer, or footballer. So, so you know, it's, it's always, always kind, kind of, of the, the systemic, systemic um, racism. Yeah. Well, I think this is a great um, lesson for Black Girl World Travelers. You learn so much by travel, and mm -hmm. I think. For me, I think this, this we have a duty to so, find solutions to these problems and to help, uh, or not even, yeah, help our Black yeah. brothers and sisters across the diaspora, but also, like, help ourselves by forcing change. <laughs> and we do that by analyzing yeah, yeah. what yeah, we yeah. can contribute. Like, we have a responsibility role in this. We cannot be passive. Yeah, yeah. We have to do something. Um, and so as we wrap up, um, what, what are your, what would you like to impart to black, black travelers, black girl world travelers, young women, older women, women of all ages, um, as we uh, wrap up? I would say, um, I would say. Yes, travel, not just because it's trendy, because, for example, I started to travel when it was not trendy. Uh, travel for yourself first. Travel for, I don't want to say for your future generation, but to be an agent of change in the sense by being more conscious of how the world is, you will be a better global citizen um, and better human being if you don't do dodgy things. <laughs> uh, but because you will realize the first it will force you to for self discovery resourcefulness growth all these which are good uh, to be a better human being but also you're going to be an agent of influence because you're going to have two crowds you're going to have the crowd who hate you and is jealous and you have the crowd who wish they would be like you because they don't have the courage to put the first foot so just tell them you know, um, the first foot or the first step, if you can't do it yourself, try to go in groups, you know, and then start yourself locally, not too far, maybe 100 kilometers, 200 kilometers, one hour flight, you know, and then start to see further. And then you will see that um, the world that you've been brainwashed is not the world, it's not the reality, <laughs> it's not the reality. Um, be cautious because I know from the time I started to now, there's more safety issues for women. Uh, like for example, me, I used to only do Airbnb at women's place. I never stay at a man because I read so many horror story about hidden camera harassment and all those stuff. I would not feel comfortable staying at a single man house personally. So I've read so many things and I, I feel like when I started, I was carefree <laughs> compared to all the things I've seen. Uh, maybe I was lucky. The world was a better place, I guess. Um, but um, yeah, be open, but be wary uh, that you can be a target as a black woman, as a solo woman. You know, some people say wear a ring, you know, a fake ring or Never say that you travel alone. Yeah, that's the most accurate one uh, because people try to target you and, you know, you, they, you have weirdos. Don't um, publish on social media in real time also. Publish after you come back. It's the best to have peace, uh, not to be jinx, all those things, because I remember I was so happy. I was hiking and suddenly, first time in my life, uh, I twist my ankle because I say to someone. So, yeah, bad I exist. So I've learned of you don't post in real life. Don't say to people when you leave, because also they get used to you not being around. They could come to burglar your house, you know, you never know. So all these are like safety measures, protect yourself, protect your assets, uh, protect your safety as a woman. Don't, I used to not go out alone if I don't know anybody, especially in Praia del Carmen, because there's a lot of alcohol around and funky people. So don't put yourself at risk. Um, if you're not comfortable, try not to arrive at night because sometimes the taxi are weird. But <laughs> you, it's not only the hotel; it can be the taxi people. They are 
thanks God now we have Uber and stuff, but at the time, sometimes there was no Uber in some countries. Um, and they start to be too curious. Oh, are you alone? Da, da, da. What do you do? Da, da. No, you don't have to reply. Just say, no, my boyfriend is joining. Oh, I, oh, I'm joining my boyfriend. It's best to de- say that. I'm joining my best friend. She's already there. So therefore, they know you're not alone and they can't, you know, put, have dirty ideas in their mind, you know? So especially in countries where they fetishize black women, it happens to me closer to home in South Europe. <laughs> Uh, it's horrible when it happens to you. Um, so ask your friend. Yeah, ask your friend because I was told so many stories by friend, and that's why some countries I put them last on my list, and I actually leave those stories myself. And I was shocked. I was like, people are so narrow-minded here. They think that every black woman they see is a prostitute. It's horrible. So, and I end up crying. I went to a brother cafe, a black man in Madrid. He said. They've been nasty to you. He knew. It was horrible. He knew. I, I came, yeah, I came crying in his coffee. He gave me a free coffee and he said, they've been nasty to you. I say, yeah, they think I'm a prostitute. They follow me around. What's the problem? And he said, yeah, because in their mind, you're all the same. And I said, what the fuck? No, it's horrible. So spare yourself. If you can, I don't want to say blacklist some places, but ask around also, even if usually I prefer to make my own uh, opinion ask around because you might save yourself trouble of being embarrassed shamed you know you should not be shamed because of your color your gender you have the right to exist if those people don't want to see you too bad for them <laughs> not too bad for them uh, that's the way but uh, we exist we deserve to be around I remember the most respectful the only Asian country I've been is Japan I never had any issues there. Everyone is respectful. Uh, some kids were so happy to see me. They greet me and they say, hello, 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 hello. It's so cute, you know. But I've, for example, I was harassed in my... <laughs> they just grabbed my hair. It was horrible. There was a group of 20 and they just grabbed my hair. And I just did bread at the Senegalese salon. And they grabbed my hair, touched me and stuff. And I'm like, hey, I would never come to China to do that to you, you know. It's like... It's out of place. So, yes, maybe you can take a picture, but you can't touch me and grab my hand, grab my body. No. Hello, I'm not an animal. Even if I was an animal, I have the right to be in peace. Uh, I'm not a curiosity. I'm a human being. So, as a black woman, uh, be aware that you will attract uh, sometimes bad behavior. And it's up to you to put the boundaries to say, I don't know you like that. <laughs> Boundaries are essential. Yeah. Boundaries are how we protect our peace and create mm-hmm. our sense of safety. So that's amazing. Thank you. Yes. So much, Christina. Well, Stay safe. Thank all right. You. Well, thank you all for listening to this episode of Black Herbal Traveler Podcast. I hope you enjoyed our talk about exploring the world through a Black woman's perspective. If you like what you heard, help us out by hitting the subscribe button, leaving a review, or sharing this episode with your favorite Black woman. In this episode, we talk with Christina Belage about being a solo traveler, serial Black expat, and inspiring Black people to travel and to expatriate to Black nations. I love to hear your thoughts, too. Drop us a comment or message, and let's keep the conversation going. Looking ahead, we've got more stories, travel tips, and honest conversations coming your way. I'm excited about celebrating meaningful adventures together. Before I wrap up, I wanted to give a big shout out to our Black Herbal Traveler community. You guys make this journey special. Remember, the adventure continues. Keep exploring. Stay true to your journey. And we'll catch you next time. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Mm-hmm.